express complex emotions in an artistic way. Brian Tierney joins us to talk about maintaining his personal recovery while working in the recovery field. Service is a key ingredient for him, and he is proud to be a part of programs like Colorado Artists in Recovery and Recovery Cafe. He talks about coming from a mindset of scarcity and insecurity and how Red Rock Recovery Center has helped him and others find balance. Enjoy. Welcome to the Illuminate Recovery Podcast. We shed light on mental health issues, mental illness, and addiction recovery. Ways to cope, manage, and inspire. Beyond the self-care we will discuss, you may need the help of a licensed professional. My name is Kurt Nider. I'm a husband, a father, entrepreneur, a handyman, and a student of life. I avoid conflict, I deflect with humor, and I'm fascinated by the human experience. And I'm Shelly Mangum. I am a clinical mental health counselor, and my favorite role of all times is grandma. I am a seeker of truth, and I feel like life should be approached with tremendous curiosity. I ask the dumb questions. I fill in the gaps. Brian Tierney is here with us today. Brian works at Red Rock Recovery. He's been in the um, recovery industry for quite some time and has a story of his own. He's very involved in helping people uh, heal and grow. Brian, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Shelly. Yeah, thank you for inviting me and, and having me on. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I want to um, maybe just ask a little bit, give some background to our listeners. How'd you end up getting in this industry? Yeah, that's a, that's a great place to start. Um, I uh, am a person in, in long-term recovery. And um, until I entered into recovery, I always, I felt like I wanted to be in some kind of a helping profession, but uh, just could never navigate the fear of moving into, moving into this space. And uh, I always had some financial concerns about doing counseling or something like that. And uh, once I got into recovery, I came to realize I really didn't like the field that I was in. I was doing property management. And um, it just wasn't, you know, I was waking up every day and not wanting to go to work. And that was uh, not something really conducive to the recovery and the lifestyle that I was trying to cultivate in my recovery. So uh, I moved through that fear. I took a massive pay cut on the recommendation of somebody that I met in a, in a recovery community, a 12-step recovery community. And uh, they suggested that I go get an entry-level position at a treatment center and uh, like cut my teeth there. And if I could do that for six months to a year and I'm not jaded or burnt out by the end of it, that I might just be, you know, cut out to, to be in this space. Cause there's a lot of people that get into recovery, I think early on that want to give back in a professional way. And um, can be, it can be disillusioning to actually get involved with the treatment opposed to like recovery perspective. So I got in there, I took an entry level position, it was a massive pay cut, I moved through a lot of fear, and uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I was, felt like I was thriving there, like spiritually and emotionally, and I really felt like I would wake up in the morning and be like, I can't wait to get in, like I'm going to talk to so-and-so about this, and we're going to do this, and I'm going to help this person do that, and it was really fulfilling, and um, it's been about five years now, uh, so I started entry level operations. I was doing overnight shifts for an extended care treatment program. And that is definitely one way to really kind of cut your teeth in the space and, and learn some stuff. And, uh, you know, moved my way and navigated through, got some certifications and um, moved into doing some counseling and some recovery coaching and uh, have landed now in community outreach and, and uh, business development. But it was a lot of fear to, to take that first step, but I'm really glad that I did because it was... Uh, it was such a fulfilling way to to go about making a living uh, for me, and uh, yeah, so. Well, that's that's incredible, and you talk about the financial piece of it, and I, it sounds like that was a major piece of making that decision for you, mm -hmm. as it is, I think, for a lot of people even trying to get into recovery, um, costs can be prohibitive, and here you are willing to take this huge price cut and go into an industry that's new to you. I don't know, can you talk about the, some of the fear that was around that? Yeah, um, 
but yeah, the main fear was definitely financial and like, am I going to be okay? Am I going to be able to navigate through this space? Um, but luckily I was in such a place of willingness in an early stage of my recovery that, uh, you know, new opportunities, uh, didn't seem as scary as they once did because I now had this foundation for how to navigate life essentially, which I did not have before. Um, you know, before I got into recovery, so much of my decisions and my life was fear-based as am I, am I going to get enough? Am I going to lose what I already have? And it was, it was always coming from this place of scarcity and uh, insecurity. And then when I got into recovery, I learned some new tools, you know, I built a foundation, um, that helped me be able to look at risk and approach it and, and do it willingly and do it with some level of grace. Um, so that was really a, a foundational part of it. I think my recovery was there first. I was doing involved with a 12 step community. I was doing therapy. I had done treatment. So I really like invested a, a good amount of my time into building that foundation. And then when these opportunities came up, I wasn't making them from a place of fear or insecurity. I was making them from a place of you know, what's going to fill my cup up? What's going to, what's going to bring me a life that I, I want to have in recovery. And, you know, I didn't know that working in treatment or working in the recovery space was going to provide that for me, but I was, I was willing to take the risk to find out. And uh, I'm glad that I did. I'm, re I'm really glad that I did because I really enjoy working in this space and I, I volunteer with a lot of nonprofits and I also, um, you know, work with Red Rock Recovery Center. Um, and uh, it is just, it's a life beyond my wildest dreams being able to do it. And I know it's not for everybody, but for me, it's really, it's really worked out. When you meet a new client, which I imagine you do occasionally or quite often, how do you convince them <clears throat> to take that leap of faith and maybe enter treatment when it feels overwhelming to them? Because it sounds like you have a pretty good perspective that you may be able to relate yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, when I, whenever I'm working with somebody who's relatively new in the recovery process or maybe re-entering their recovery process, um, I just try to help them be informed and I try to connect with them. I think it's really important that there's a connection there. Being in recovery, having navigated a lot of the same experiences that they have, maybe not exactly the same, but certainly the same kind of feelings of shame and guilt. And um, it's, it's a unique experience to run up to run up to somebody with uh, an addictive dis disorder where you really do not want to drink that night and you tell yourself you're not going to drink that night and then you find yourself drinking. That is a unique experience to have. And when I can connect with somebody on that level, they kind of open the door up a little bit. And I, I honestly, I try to stay away from convincing them to do anything. I don't like to kind of coerce or manipulate or trick anybody into treatment, but I do like to just hear some information. like. Here's what helped me. Here's my experience. Here's what some of the research shows. So like here, you, you know, now that we're connected and we're talking and we have some, you know, some rapport built, here's some information about what you can do to, to live a life, you know, that's much better than, than what you have been experiencing up to this point. And then they're free to make that decision for themselves. And I think more often to, than not, when I take that approach, they're more receptive to, um, engaging and investing in their recovery process, whatever that is for them. And it doesn't always go that way, but, uh, you know, that's the approach that I, I prefer to take rather than trying to kind of trick somebody to, to get in. Um, and it can be difficult because often people are very close to their disease, uh, when they're entering into treatment. So they, a lot of distorted thinking is going on a lot of perception of reality that is, um, not conducive to, to wanting to grow at all. So getting through some of those barriers, I think, is assisted by creating that initial rapport so they kind of let their guard down a little bit and then just letting them know, like, I'm not here to convince you to do anything. I'm here to look just like, here's the information. Here's what you can do. Here's my experience. Here's some other people's experience. And, you know, this is what, this is what life can be for you. You know, and there's some things you got to do to get it, but, you know, it's possible. And, um, that's that's the way that I, I typically approach it. Well, that's incredibly empowering to them as well. It gives them, you know, gives back into their hands choice um, mm -hmm. because that 
that disease takes a lot of choice away from them. You know, just like you said, you know, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do this. I don't want to do this. And then they're doing it. And so I love that empowering. I think it's vital in their recovery for that. So I think it's an excellent approach. You talked about doing nonprofit work. Um, You work for Red Rock Recovery. Um, Can you talk about some of those organizations that you work with and how they specifically help and support the people um, that you care about? Yeah. Um, I'll start with, with Red Rock. That's been an organization. That's, that's where I started, got an entry level position and kind of have worked my way through the company and and been with it as it's, as it's grown pretty significantly, uh, since I came on with them about four and a half, five years ago. Um, I really enjoy working with this agency and believe in their mission because being an in-network provider, they make care more accessible and they have a, a full continuum. So they're able to kind of meet people wherever they're at, whether they need to do outpatient services or they need a full medical detox and inpatient residential kind of stay. Um, but what really has kept me there is um, the investment that this agency has in their alumni community. And I always, when I'm looking at other treatment centers, am always assessing for what are they doing for people once they get out of the treatment? Because treatment is really only the beginning. I mean, if somebody believes that they can go to detox or even just a 30-day or 28-day residential and come out completely fine, um, you know, I always try to educate people that that's typically not the case. Uh, Typically, that's the beginning. That is where you can get back in your body and feel, you know, healthy again to some degree and start working on deeper levels of trauma and and mental illness that is typically co-occurring with with substance use disorders. So um, having that full continuum there is definitely helpful, but, you know, recovery is is a lifetime commitment. So what are people doing to support people once they're leaving care? And typically it's a difficult thing for treatment centers to kind of wrap their head around at times because there's not necessarily... um, financial incentive to do recovery uh, support services after someone's discharged from their care. Um, But what I saw Red Rock do really well and why I love being a part of it is we have, you know, two dedicated full-time staff that just do alumni services. And um, I was one of those staff at one point uh, and initially got to help develop uh, a lot of alumni programming for Red Rock. And to see that community grow, to see people come back, to be a part of uh, something that's bigger than themselves and really engage in a sense of purpose and a safe and supportive, like unconditionally supportive community, I think is vital for people, especially, I mean, at any stage of recovery, but especially that first 18 months to two years is is really important for for people to be engaged with something like that. So that is something that uh, has, has really drawn me to Red Rock and kept me there. Um, and, uh, something that I, I really, uh, try to stay close to, um, with the, the nonprofits, that's something that, uh, was suggested to me early in my recovery, one, to always be, uh, working, uh, some kind of a peer-based community program, like a 12-step program, uh, to volunteer somewhere and to, and if I'm working in treatment, to not make that my program essentially. So, uh, uh, in my entire recovery, I've, I've maintained those commitments and I found it to be a, a healthy balance for me and, um, you know, service being a huge part of what recovery can provide uh, to somebody. When, and when you're really engaging with service, you get to enact that sense of purpose, which can keep you close to wanting to work a program because you actually have something to give. Um, so, you know, in, in my addiction, I, I felt worthless. I felt like all I did was take from people and cause pain and, and, and harm. And uh, in my recovery, I want to do the opposite. And, you know, service provides me the opportunity to do that and to feel like I have something to give back. And that's uh, that's really impactful. Um, so I maintain, um, you know, volunteer commitments with, with nonprofits. And the one that I'm really interested in and working with right now, I'm on their board for uh, Colorado Artists in Recovery which essentially provides free uh, workshops to support people's creative expression at any stage of recovery. So they'll do music classes, creative writing classes, art classes, medica- meditation classes, things like that. Even we're, we're, I think we're hiring a dance instructor here soon to do like movement expression. Um, so that, uh, that kind of stuff 
I found to be really helpful because I found a, a safe and supportive uh, artistic community early in recovery that really helped me learn to express difficult and complex emotions in a healthy way. And uh, often what we're doing in recovery is learning how to react to the human condition, to, to the things we're experiencing in a healthy way because we didn't have those tools before. And that's what led us to, to drink and use because these emotions and feelings and thoughts would be overwhelming and we were just trying to dial them down a little bit. Um, so finding something, whether, you know, for me it was creative expression, if it's exercise, whatever hobby you find, whatever it is, it's important to find something that you can express yourself through in a way that's, that's helpful so that you're gonna, you know, you're gonna experience difficult emotions in recovery, especially in early recovery. Uh, and to have an outlet for that, I think is really important and to help people build those tools and provide a community for people to do that is, is, uh, something I'm really passionate about. So. Um, I've also been a part of uh, Recovery Cafe, which is in Longmont, Colorado, which really helps people. It's a safe and supportive community for people who kind of slip through the cracks a little bit. And uh, so working with indigenous people um, uh, to be able to have a community that they can come by that's not just like a drop-by shelter or something like that, but actually helps them empower themselves to be a part of a community and instill some peer leadership uh, skills and values. So those are two ones that are near and dear to me. So um, if you don't know about them, Recovery Cafes, they are kind of up and down the West Coast. They're expanding a little bit. There's one or two here in Colorado. And then Colorado Artists in Recovery is another one that is just, um, I'm really passionate about supporting and a couple Really close friends of mine, uh, Darren Valdez is the one who started it, um, is out there really doing the, the groundwork to, to make it happen. So it's the Colorado uh, Artists in Recovery is fascinating. Are those are those classes available to anybody? Are they are they available specifically to people in recovery? What is what is that kind of an invitation look like? Yeah, the, the, it's it's open to everybody. Uh, it is definitely designed towards people in recovery. Um, definitely designed for people who are in recovery or uh, from either substance use or mental illness. Um, but we've had people that are even just consider themselves like allies of recovery and they're wanting to engage with it. So there's a couple sayings out there like everybody's in recovery from something. You know, we're all we're recovering from life at the very least. So uh, if you are interested in learning this stuff or being a part of it, everyone is, is welcome to join these things. and. Uh, Right now, a lot of the classes are virtual still, so we have people from all over the country participating, but uh, at some point we'll probably move back to in-person once it's safe to do so. But I think we may maintain some virtual stuff so that people from out of state can still participate. And are those primarily just a, a traditional art class for that group, or is are they talking about you know recovery principles? Are they, is there you know, a key theme every time they have a class or is it really just more of a, you know, fraternity? It's, it's definitely based on recovery principles. So what we do, it's a kind of a two part thing that we do is when we offer these workshops, but we also recruit, train and hire people who are in recovery, who have an artistic uh, talent. Uh, so if somebody is very good at guitar or very good at piano or very good at art or very good at whatever it is, we help them instill peer leadership and then we pay them to facilitate the class. Uh, and while we're kind of coaching them how to build their workshop, we're peppering in uh, recovery principles, a lot of which is, you know, encouraging people to express themselves, encouraging people to uh, be a part of a community and reach out for help if needed. Uh, and really tapping into that unconditional acceptance. Um, so much of what a lot of people experience in early recovery is feeling like unlovable and you know not being able to fit in in the right place is always kind of feeling a little off and distance from the people around them. So a big uh, part of those workshops, uh, you know, they'll have the artistic element, uh, the creative expression element, but a lot of that is tied into how does that function within a community that is unconditionally supportive. So that they are really designed on, on those recovery principles. So it's not just like a basic art class that teaches you. You'll learn that stuff too, but it, it's all tied into how you can use this to enhance your recovery. Yeah, and you mentioned the exercise thing. I think we see the exercise thing a lot more. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's you know just easier for people to do or, or what the story is, but one of the things that you just said was that it helped you 
learn to express complex emotions in an artistic way. Can you tell us what mm -hmm. that's like? What is, what did, what did that feel like? How did it help you in your process? Yeah. So I grew up, um, learning, I learned how to play music at a, at a young age and grew up like uh, playing piano and, and I taught myself guitar at one point in my teenage years and was definitely something I was very passionate about, but lost at some point in my recovery, uh, or in my addiction. And, um, when I got back into recovery, I was invited into a group, um, that was recovery based that was for musicians in recovery. And, um, I had so much fear around doing that. And uh, I also, when I got into recovery, like I didn't know what my hobbies were. I, I, had my, I didn't know what my identity was. Like I was really reshaping uh, who I thought I was and who I could be. Uh, and when you remove drinking and drugs from the equation, there's often a large hole in what I do with my day-to-day uh, -day activities. So to find something to fill that is, you know, very important, I think. So, um, for me, my experience was, uh, being reintroduced to music in a, in a community that was unconditionally supportive, allowed me to pick up a guitar again. And, uh, I hadn't touched one in probably five or six years at that point. And it, you know, re-engaged me with a part of myself that I thought I had lost. Uh, and today what it still looks like is, you know, I'll come home from work and I, I plug in and I'll play for a little bit and just kind of process my day a little bit. And, uh, you know, then, you know, 20 minutes later, I'm kind of in a new space. And that kind of expression I have found to be really, really helpful and stabilizing for me. Um, so that's what it that's what it can look like for me. But I know for a lot of other people, it's different. Maybe it's drawing for them or maybe even dance or yoga or whatever it is. Um, but to find that hobby to find that interest that you're passionate about and reconnect with it and move through the shame and guilt or whatever you have around it uh, is incredibly empowering. So it is such a vulnerable thing to do to create something artistically and then share it with people. And it is terrifying to do that. Um, and to, to do that in recovery and to move through that fear, I think is a valuable experience for anybody to have at any stage of their recovery to go. I've always wanted to write a song. I've never known how to do it. Uh, I barely can play. Uh, and then to learn some of those skills and actually do it. Uh, and then you see them receive the unconditional support on the other side of that and they just light up. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to witness somebody who maybe hasn't touched a guitar or tried to write a short story and decades do it and share it with somebody and receive that support and all of a sudden things are possible again you know like opportunity opens up and a passion may be discovered that is you know can kind of fill that that void that you know drinking and drugs when you remove those things that, that can be left there yeah it's, it's the natural high with the right levels right yeah. the right natural levels that kind yeah. of help you get to that correction and then also a certain amount of distraction right it gives you yeah I know, I know it's always important to not replace addiction with addiction, right? And and this falls into the category Dif of, difficult to know, do, challenging, yeah. <laughs> right? It gives you yeah. it gives you a challenge, and because there's sometimes, especially if you're coming from that you know addictive mindset where you really just need something to just distract yourself, right? Be able yeah. to turn your brain off or focus on or whatever, and this just fills that void so well. At the yeah. same time, like you said, it is a challenge. It does require, you know, you to open up some of those feeling kind of gateways as opposed to compressing and disappearing, you know, into, into addiction. So um, I, I find it intriguing. I think it's actually really awesome. Um, it makes me want to look, you know, to see what types of programs are around here. How ha has that been embraced by the team at Red Rock as well? Do they participate in those same types of groups or have the same type of programs or do you keep, do you end up having to kind of keep those pretty exclusive? Oh, uh, they're not, they're definitely open. So at, at Red Rock, uh, in our alumni community, we definitely have a lot of that stuff where we are connecting people to those kind of resources that, that Colorado Artists in Recovery or Recovery Cafe or Phoenix uh, Multisport, you know, they, they do the active lifestyle, whatever that is, we definitely encourage our alumni to be a part of it. And uh, what that will look like, Red Rock is also a part of TPAS, which is Treatment Professionals and Alumni Services, which 
in that space, we work with other alumni programs from other treatment centers to kind of host bigger events. So one that we have coming up pretty soon is we're actually hosting an open mic and some people from CARE will probably be there and some other people from the recovery community will be there. And uh, again, it's another opportunity for people to kind of move through that fear and share something that they created in a, in a supportive community. And leaning into that vulnerability is uh, once you do it a couple of times, uh, I think it helps, you know, think about working on a four step or something or, or think about thinking working with a therapist, uh, you know, really diving into your trauma, leaning into that vulnerability can be really scary. And uh, I think, you know, building some of that up by helping them do some creative expression can help them approach some of that stuff a little bit more readily uh, because they've had some experience leaning into vulnerability and receiving that positive feedback and, and knowing that they have the ability to do it without it kind of destroying them. Because that was always an issue for me too. I could never really look too deeply at my past or look too deeply at my um, at fears or trauma that I experienced. Uh, but through creative expression, I didn't have to talk about it. So I could I could express it in a way that was approachable and that made the fear of it kind of get dialed back a little bit and, and more helpful to approach it in other clinical settings. So, yeah, uh, we definitely at Red Rock, we definitely like working with with partners like Colorado Artists in Recovery for our alumni community. You talked about being involved also with Recovery Cafe mm -hmm. and the work that they do. Can you talk about that a little bit more? It sounds really interesting and needed. Yeah. So I, I was so glad to have uh, come across that, that agency and they were looking for someone who was in recovery to be a part of their, their board to come on to have, to offer that perspective for them. Uh, and, uh, they really focus on people that kind of slip, slip through the cracks. So people that maybe have exhausted a lot of their resources to get to treatment or, uh, or living on the street, or are in transitional housing, that kind of situation. And they have some principles laid out, uh, first and foremost being um, radical acceptance, I think is how they word it. So everyone is accepted as they are, as they come. And what they do is they they offer a space for people to come, and it's not your traditional kind of drop-in homeless shelter where people can just come for food and leave. There's a lot of activities that go on. There's there's um, much more meaningful connection. What I was always blown away by uh, the the involvement the actual board members had with the participants in the community. So they were actually volunteers sitting at the table, connecting uh, with people coming in and, and creating meaningful relationships and, and just really humanizing them. A lot of times people who are experiencing homelessness can feel dehumanized and um, can feel disconnected from the rest of the world. And this recovery cafe provided a space for them to come and, and feel like real human, you know, feel and be treated like, like humans as they deserve to be. And, um, they also are able to connect people to resources if that's what the person's interested in uh, and work with a lot of community partners in the area to help people access services and support them as um, you know, a, a recovery community organization uh, as a part of their kind of holistic healing process as they're going through it. And that's kind of different for everybody, but that's, that's one that was definitely really special to be a part of, uh, working in the treatment space. Um, I tend to work with people who still have resources available to them or loved ones willing to, to help them get access to care. So they haven't completely burned all those bridges yet, or haven't gone, uh, out, uh, into the, into the streets and, and those kind of things. Um, we're at the recovery cafe. That's exactly who they work with. And that's, that's who they're helping kind of get back on their feet and providing them that essential part to the recovery process, which is community, um, for them as they're doing whatever else they're doing with, with, uh, maybe a social worker or a case manager at another facility. So when you talk about radical acceptance, accepting them exactly where they are, does that include allowing them to continue to use while they're, you know, while they're in the program? And I use the word program loosely, but, yeah. you know, what are the boundaries and limitations? So the, the only requirement is that they're sober when they're there. 
and it, it, it is, uh, I think they asked for 24 hours of, of sobriety to, to come in and p to participate. Um, but they also can completely understand the recovery process is not a linear thing, especially for people in these situations. It can be uh, a lot, uh, you know, relapse or reoccurrence of use can ha happen. But as, if somebody's still willing and, and wanting to kind of show up, they're not excluded from being a part of the community because they're struggling with maintaining, you know, abstinence-based sobriety. Um, but they are encouraged to, uh, or, or asked to be sober when they are at the, the, the site, um, just to keep everybody safe. But if relapse does occur, it's not, Hey, you can't come here anymore. Or you're kicked out of the program. It's what can we do to help you? So it doesn't happen again. Or how can we, how can we minimize the impact of it happening again, if it does? So that's uh, you know, more of a harm reduction approach, which is, I think much more appropriate for especially that, that population. Um, yeah. And is there a limit to how long they can stay um, at, at Recovery Cafe and take advantage of those services? What does that look like? So, no, there isn't a limit. Uh, they, I think the average length is, is probably about nine months the last time I saw a report from about that. But people are welcome and encouraged to kind of stick around and Maybe they use some more of the groups earlier on, and then they transition into more of a peer leadership kind of hybrid um, volunteer role, um, and then they can you know, indefinitely be a part of the community. Hmm. That's incredible. And in the back of my head, I'm wondering, how do they get funded to provide those services? Where does that come from? Oh, at nonprofits, you know, it's grants and, and, and fundraising, you know, so that is constantly what the board is always working towards, uh, identifying grants and uh, going after them and then also cultivating funders to, to keep the, the mission alive. Um, and that's the same thing with Colorado Artists in Recovery as well. They have uh, some donation base and can do some partnerships with treatment centers to offer services, but Recovery Cafe is definitely you know, based off of funding, so to keep the services uh, free and accessible to people. So that's a constant, constant hunt and, and battle. Um, but uh, luckily, there's been a lot of research supporting recovery community organizations that have come out of the past five years, mostly coming out of the Recovery Research Institute, which is based out of the Harvard Medical School, um, which is showing efficacy around recovery-based, you know, peer-based community support uh, before that, it didn't really exist. We all kind of knew it, like 12 steps stuff has been around for, you know, decades and decades and has been pretty effective for a lot of people, but there's not a lot of research on it because it's an anonymous program. Uh, but within the past five, 10 years, they've really made a concerted effort to invest in research around peer-based services, recovery community organizations, uh, referencing here William White's work, who did a lot with recovery coaching and peer-to-peer uh, -peer relations and how that supports people's recovery as a kind of holistic approach to the treatment process, not in place of treatment process, but as a part of. And uh, with that research, you know, grants are more willing to fund, uh, or, you know, granters are more, um, Agencies are more willing to fund these kind of services because now the research suggests that it is pretty effective. And, you know, there is actually a considerable amount of money that people can get after for if you're interested in creating a recovery com community organization at the federal level for, for these kind of services. So um, I could go down that wormhole and I probably went a little too far than I needed to. But just to say that there is funding out there because the research is, is showing that it's really helpful as a part of somebody's recovery regimen. Now, I think that's interesting. Is that are are those resources also available through that network? Meaning, like you said, if I want to open a recovery cafe, you know, and I get on to the network and I start to research how to make sure that I'm doing it right and you know, staying within the standards of the program, do you have you know access to some of the, that information available to help support? Yeah, so um, there are organizations that will even offer specific trainings about how to start your RCO, your recovery community organization, and where do you get, you know, how do you go after grants, and 
Uh, Colorado has a lot of great resources for nonprofits, so there's a lot of free courses you can take around fundraising strategies and things like that. Um, Advocates for Recovery here in Colorado offers a RCO training, I believe, and so does Peer Coach Academy, which is another nonprofit based out of Colorado. They offer a seminar on how to get your RCO up and running. Um, Those are the only two I know about, uh, but I'm sure that there's a lot more out there. Um, SAMHSA has information on this stuff as well. Uh, And then it's a matter of just being involved with your local politics to know what kind of grants are coming down the pike and, uh, you know, uh, going after them and applying for them. Hmm. That's um, that's fascinating. I know there's a lot of that going on, but but I love that you connect that with your, you know, your passion of helping make sure that these people have people in recovery have that ongoing community and aftercare, because like you said, it's not going to happen in 30 days. It's a lifetime of recovery. Um, and in that space, I want to ask, what are some of the, what are some of the key things that you do, Brian, to keep you in recovery and keep you going down the path you want to go? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> My, my recovery is, I, w- I was taught early on, and I have attempted recovery a few times. I, w- I w- had been to multiple treatment centers before I really stuck with this round of recovery. Um, you know, I've been sober and working an active program of recovery since uh, January 17th, 2016. Um, and before that, I had probably had uh, four or five stays at uh, treatment centers and detoxes and psych wards and things of that nature before this really clicked for me. Um, when I got to the point where I was ready to kind of embrace an entirely different design for living, um, uh, I just, I, I really took stock of what was happening around me and who, who seemed to be living a life that I wanted to have. And those people seemed to be very active in service and very active, uh, in recovery communities. Uh, so initially it was, it was 12 steps for me. It was a lot, that's a very accessible recovery community to get involved with. And I still, uh, maintain, um, you know, active participation in those. Um, but also therapy, the treatment was very helpful. And then I continued with therapy for the first two years of my recovery. And if ever I'm feeling a little overwhelmed or burdened, I, I tap right back into, into getting into therapy and uh, I've worked with uh, recovery coaches for myself. Um, I've yeah, been on medications before that have helped. Um, when I think about like what what I want to do for my recovery to sustain, it's like what what tool am I not willing to use? Like I want to use every tool that's at my disposal as possible because the disease of alcoholism and addiction is just so brutal and it is, it is uh, in the 12-step lingo, it's cunning and baffling, it's insidious, right? Uh, in other other spaces, it's just it's a really complex uh, thing to work with. Uh, so I'm going to use every tool that's available to me uh, that that I can to maintain my recovery and and stay engaged with it. And uh, for me, that looks like a lot of service because if I have a commitment to somewhere, then I have a reason to be at that meeting, or I have a reason to show up at that nonprofit, or I have a reason to go into work. Um, so I'm more actively participating in the community and I feel more involved with it. I feel empowered to be a part of it. Uh, and it's less of a passive kind of show up and sit down and, you know, listen and maybe go, maybe not. Um, that just ha- that doesn't work for me. Um, so real, in, you know, active participation and kind of taking stock on, of, of what people who have significant quality recovery are doing around me and they, they tend to be very involved with their communities. Um, so that's one that really, really helps, really helps me staying involved with community, being of service and utilizing every tool I have at my disposal without hesitation. Like it, if I need help in some way, I'm going to ask for it. I'm going to, I'm going to utilize it. Um, not going to, not engage with something because of stigma around it or whatever's going on. I'm going to use every tool that's at my disposal because this yeah, this disease is is pretty pretty serious and can creep back up on you uh, if you kind of what I, I call it uh, getting reset to my default programming. If I ever deviate too far from being engaged actively with with uh, my recovery network, 
you know, I tend to, my default network, my default programming tends to come back online and uh, can easily, you know, get me back into causing harm or being selfish and just on a, on a path that's not what I want to be going down. So um, that's, yeah, that's, that's how I would kind of wrap that up. Uh, I'm sure I could unpack it some more, but I think that's a good way to, to put it. So speaking of default programming, that's one of the things you mentioned early on was that there, as you got into recovery, one of the concerns was that scarcity and insecurity mentality and that, you know, kind of, you've got to be able to take that keeping up with the Joneses and excelling in life type thing and, and do something different with it. Right. So, so mm -hmm. how do you handle that now? Right. Did this, did this, did this process and being, um, active in service and that kind of thing, does that help you just let go, you know, some of that scarcity mentality, or is it, do you have a different way that you have to approach those things now? Oh yeah, definitely a much, much different approach from pre recovery to now active recovery. Um, what the service helps me do in the active participation in these communities, it helps me stay close to the principles of those communities. It helps me stay close to the people that help me recall those principles to the forefront of my consciousness on a regular basis. Uh, and when I'm living from those principles, I'm, I'm much more um, able to navigate risk, navigate uh, uh, fear, uh, navigate you know, feelings of insecurity financially or otherwise. Um, and it's when I distance myself from those communities that I find that those things really start to pop back up, that scarcity mentality starts to come back in and I don't have enough or I don't make enough or I don't, I don't have this, I need this and all this stuff. And that's a, you know, a, a headspace that is, you know, just a recipe for disaster in, in my case. Uh, so, yeah, the service part keeps me connected and being connected allows me to keep those principles that I'm trying to live, you know, with me and, and current in my, my conscious. Cause, uh, cause I mean, it's, it's one thing to read a book and to like, wow, they, they like the four agreements, what, you know, that's great. And I love the four agreements, not, not trying to bash them at all. I love them. But if I just read it and then put it down, eventually that knowledge fades. But if I consistently engaged with it in my day-to-day -day life and had a community to help me stay plugged in with it, then it's actually going to take root and and uh, become a part of my core beliefs. Um, so the community aspect really important. Staying involved with it through service is is help helps keeps that stuff uh, readily available to me. You talked about keeping having where you work not be a replacement for your program and be able to keep your recovery separate from your job, mm -hmm. so to speak. That seems like it'd be a little tough to do because those inner, they, they inner, they cross, they cross paths so much. How, how do you keep that separate? That is a great question. And it's this, I have a conversation with anybody who uh, is interested in the addiction treatment space or starting out in the addiction treatment space. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have some mentors in my life that really were in recovery and worked in the addiction treatment space. And they were very quick to let me know that this is not your program. This is not your recovery program. This is definitely something that is a profession that can fill your cup up, but it is not a replacement for working, uh, for therapy or being a part of a 12 step community or another recovery community. Um, I had a glaring uh, um, example of what it, it can look like when treatment, working in treatment becomes your recovery program for somebody in recovery. And I saw it happen early on working in, in the space that I was in. And it was, it was kind of a warning to me. It's like, oh, that can, you know, this can really burn me out, chew me up and spit me out if I don't take care of myself. And I, I put it like working in treatment, those first six, eight months, I was doing the overnight live-in shifts at a, as an operations tech. Um, you know, I could have went two ways. Like that could have chewed me up and spit me out and I would have been so burnt out. Or I could plug all any frustrations I had and difficulties I was experiencing working with the oftentimes treatment resistant population. Uh, and I plugged that into my recovery. And uh, that's what I ch chose to do and continue to choose to do so that like I have a space to process these things. 
So I always encourage people to really find the motivation to go to that meeting after you get off shift, uh, to you know work with that mentor, or sponsor, or counselor, or therapist, or all of them if you know if you're lucky enough to have all that. Um, you know, do all these things because it's going to help you be better at your job, uh, and it's going to help you be kind of built to last because burnout is a very real thing in the addiction treatment space and. If you're not taking care of yourself, it'll it'll catch up with you pretty quick, and uh, the 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 outcome, especially for somebody in recovery, uh, is usually not very pretty when somebody kind of burns out. So, um, I strongly recommend people to do what they need to do to take care of themselves outside of work and and stay active because the people that don't it um, doesn't end well usually. So, uh, yeah. I am. Um, I'm looking, and I know that our listeners can't see this, but. I know that you're a guy of integrity and that you really are applying the principles of recovery in your life because I'm looking past you at the canvas on the easel <laughs> <laughs> and thinking, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, do you, how often do you pick up that canvas and do some artwork or do you just take that out to your class with you? How does that, how does that fit into your day to day? That is, that's actually my partner's, uh, but that was for a care class that we did. Uh, it was a painting class, and we got some canvas and, and a little easel to do it, and that was something that she did for herself and her recovery. She hadn't painted in probably 10 years, uh, and one of the classes was about painting. So uh, what, being on the board with CARE, we, we ask all the board members to participate in one class a year, and uh, that was the class she chose to participate in. She's also on the board with us, and uh, that's her that's her painting back there but we like yeah we have the guitars over here it's just out of frame and then, <laughs> and then we got the painting over here and you know we're not trying to like start a band and like you know or sell paint we just do it because of the cathartic process of creative expression we know is good for us and it, it's not about can we make profit off this can you know are people going to like it it's just about the the joy of doing it and uh, and engaging with it so yeah, we have all kinds of stuff all over the place, but yeah. Very cool. You yeah. started out talking about how much money you had to give up to get into the recovery industry and to work in this realm. Are you still giving up the money and does it matter? Um, I, I don't feel like I am. I mean, when I first initially started, it was an entry-level position and I was doing like... Uh, regional stuff for property management. So I had kind of been in that space for a little bit, but, uh, so the, like going back to an entry level position was a big cut for me at that point, but where I'm at now, I'm definitely, I feel very financially stable and could, if I had stayed in that lane, could I have made, be making more money than I am now? Maybe, but I don't know if I'd be sober to be honest, cause I was really did not enjoy that line. It wasn't, it wasn't a good fit for me. Um, but, uh, I, I don't have that financial insecurity. I definitely have freedom from that today. And I, I'm, you know, what, what you, you can definitely make a, a good living, uh, in the recovery space. And I'm definitely very comfortable with, with where I'm at. And, uh, it, def it was a lot of fear in the beginning. Uh, I was researching earning potential for a counselor <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was looking at that and looking at earning potential for some other career paths. I was, you know, hold, you know, holding those up. But at the end of the day, that's not what everything's about. And even still, like there's pathways in the addiction treatment space and the recovery space where you can you, you make a, a very good living for yourself and still do really good work. So um, I believe I, I, I'm in a place that I'm, I'm happy to be in and I see a lot of opportunity ahead of me. It's funny that in the recovery world, we deal with, you know, helping people work through this stigma, right, about recovery, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And and it's hard for some people to go to rehab. It's hard for some people to admit they have addiction and all that kind of stuff. But it's ironic that then inside of the recovery community, there's some stigma about making money doing it, which yeah. is a little bit ironic to me right and as as medical billers obviously we see this a ton yeah um you know therapists who just don't have any interest in it they don't they don't care they don't want to have to deal with it they're just here to help people mm -hmm. which ultimately becomes a disservice because it makes it harder for them to take care of people if they don't just figure out a way to keep the lights on 
right? Which yeah. is really interesting. So for, for us, that comes from a place of respect of like, ultimately, the better you do at it, it opens doors. And when I say better, I mean financially, right? The more successful financially you are in the industry, it opens doors for you to be able to serve in more capacity, right? You couldn't get involved in care. You couldn't get involved in some of those other organizations if you weren't stable enough to be able to do that. And we see it in some of our facilities, right? They um, scholarship some of the individuals that come through their facility, which they wouldn't be able to do if they weren't able to, you know, cover all of their bases. And so it's kind of a funny irony, you know, that we see inside yeah. of the industry. So um, so you mentioned care, right? That's We've got um, coloradoartisanrecovery.org. Um, yep. Red Rock Recovery Center dot com, right? Mm -hmm. How else? How else do people get a hold of you? Ask questions. Well, uh, yeah, uh, you can always reach me by my email, uh, Brian Tierney. That's T I E R N E Y at Red Rock Recovery Center dot com. You can go through the website and call us that way. I'm happy to get connected with anybody in any way. Um, and I can, I definitely hear your point, Kurt. Too, it is, it's important to remain, you know, be viable, and it be, uh, you know, be fiscally responsible when you're doing it. Because if your doors are closed, you can't help anybody. You can't help anybody at all if, if you're not being responsible in that way. So we've actually done some training around that with uh, private practice therapists who yeah, tend to want to kind of give it away. And I totally understand that. But you're going to be able to help a lot more people if you can keep the lights on. That's for sure. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I love talking about this stuff. I've, I've been doing it for a couple of years now and plan to be doing it for much longer than that. So if anybody has any questions about anything I talked about during this uh, podcast, yeah, feel free to reach out, connect with me. I'm, I'm happy to chat about it. Other things that I'm, I'm chat, chatting about as another space is uh, peer recovery coaching. Uh, I do a lot of trainings to certify people in recovery coaching, and that's actually becoming a billable service in a lot of states, and uh, a lot of even commercial insurances are starting to reimburse for, for uh, recovery coaching sessions. So that's another lane uh, for people in recovery to get involved with and have a career path in. Um, but uh, happy to chat about that, happy to chat about treatment, recovery, volunteering service, whatever it is, uh, uh, yeah, please reach out. Brian, thanks for your work in the industry. Um, what an incredible example and, and model out there for others that want to recover as well. Thanks for, thanks for sharing with us today. It's been incredible. Thank you for having me, Shelly, Kurt. Great to sit with you. Appreciate being here. Thanks for being on. The Illuminate Recovery Podcast is brought to you by Illuminate Billing Advocates. Make billing and collection simple with leader in substance abuse and mental health billing services. Verification and analysis of benefits, pre-authorizations, utilization management, accurate claim submission and management, denial and appeal management, and industry-leading reporting. Improve your practice's cash flow and your ability to help your clients with Illuminate Billing Advocates.